Hello, my friends. I just, uh, well, earlier this morning, I, I viewed uh, Ivan Mike's uh, VR response to uh, uh, Ron Edwards' seminar or lecture on uh, the history of D&D in comparisons to uh, their business model, their later business model, and like in similarities to a religious organization and how... Uh, well, I'll, I'm not going to go into detail on that. I will include the links below in my commentary, as well as the links to Ivan Mike's, encouraging you to go and view these himself. Take your own opinions away from it. Uh, this is neither here nor there. The obvious topic, as the title lists, is the learning curve. And I got this from something that Ivan Mike said. It was uh, a reference to something else, and has, but it struck a a chord in me and I thought gee you know I, I wonder if I'm the only one that sees this this way uh, you know how many players learn the game by the seat of their pants versus today's YouTube and social media so what we're looking at here is the uh, uh, when I was younger when I when Mike was younger a lot of us didn't have access to social media we didn't have access to youtube the internet any of this stuff as much as some of it is hard to believe even today when i look back i can't envision how the world worked without this instant information source and that's the truth uh i got a book you know i have said i've, I've told my history a friend of mine's brother had some of the original D, D stuff we snuck into it uh, once a week to for about an hour until uh, I, the the bug got in me deep enough that i went and acquired my own uh, i was lucky that uh, uh another person i knew up the street his parents took him to a, a place called ivor's dungeon and it was a game store devoted to wargaming specifically, but the uh, in the growing industry for role-playing games was a natural uh, add-on for for uh, Ivor. So his store grew over the over the years as as we grew. And I bought my first D and D set. It was the Red Box. So this would have been circa what 82, 80, 80, 1980, 81, something like that. The original first edition red box. And uh, from there, I learned to, 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 to play and to GM by muddling my way through the rules. And I didn't understand the concept of rules heavy or rules light. I didn't understand the concept of smooth transitional rules versus chunky, uh, mechanic heavy, uh, you, know, you know, compared to what we know now. I, I didn't have any of that knowledge. Uh, my friends, the few, the handful, the small handful, and I'm referring to two or three people. This is the reason why I was, uh, I've always been comfortable running a campaign for one or two players and doing it fairly successfully because that's how I started. That's how I started. I didn't have a large pool of people to work from. And when we graduated from elementary school to the larger middle school slash high school, because it was all in the same build, uh, the same campus uh, for, for Southeast Poe, the uh, elementary school was in my hometown, and each individual hometown that feeds into the district uh, all funnels to the big campus stuck out in the middle of a bunch of cornfields. And until I became part of a, a larger social entity, I didn't have any knowledge other than what we learned from what we could get from the books and the occasional advice from um, my friend Richie's older brother who was into this stuff when he chose to, you know, didn't, you know acknowledge the, the, the plebes were in the room. The uh, additional game material, the, 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 the expert set followed. I bought the blue series as soon as it came out. I don't remember exactly the year. I'm plenty of you guys know that. I could search it up, but I don't want to waste the time at the moment. But I remember buying the box, the blue box set, fairly soon after it showed up on Ivor's shelf. And that was because uh, a friend of mine let me know that it was there, and I gave the money to him who 
whose folks were much more conducive to running them around on personal errands as opposed to my parents. My mother didn't have a driver's license until I was 16. So my mom and I learned to drive about the same time. Uh, the, the My father worked evenings and was not not the sort of person you could approach and ask, could you run me here, Dad? He wouldn't do it. That's just the nature of, the, uh, of my family life growing up. So I got to, uh, through the back of those, uh, of those books and through some adverts in the box sets, I became aware of Dungeon and Dragon magazines. And while I couldn't afford a subscription, I occasionally sent away for a, a specific, an individual copy, whatever I could afford to buy. Occasionally I would ask for a, a single copy and I'd get it. Or we would, we would look at my friend's brother's collection and we get some tips and some information. Uh, we also found ways to communicate via those magazines to find other people that were enthusiasts. But in truth, we were still too young and still didn't have the social connectivity that we had in later years to do anything but muddle our way through the rules. So there was this learning curve. Uh, the learning curve was much, much, much greater for us older generation. Fellows like Frank Frey, for example, who was creating games, but when I was just beginning to get into my stride as a collector and as a gaming enthusiast, he was neck deep in the design part of it. And so he had to learn the same way we did, by trial and error, by luck, by connecting with other similar uh, enthusiasts and guessing. You know, we didn't consider the rules as an issue. We just knew that they were they were what they were, and it was what you had, and you made the do with what you had. And if you didn't, we really latched onto that that little nugget that they put in the core books, especially in the advanced versions where it says uh, these are guidelines. These are meant to give you guidance and ideas. It's you want to add to the the, ver the literal proverbial house rule was a watchword with us because there were times when we came into situations in the gaming that the rules didn't cover. The simpler earlier rules just didn't cover. And obviously enough people run into similar issues as we did because they wrote to the magazines, they made, they wrote to the publishers, and when the advanced version came out, it addressed a lot more stuff in a wider range of, of, of areas in the gaming that had not been addressed in the earlier smaller packet books, which is to be understandable. Once again, when the first edition books came out and then, uh, then the 2.0 version of AD&D came out, although to me it was always just AD&D, uh, I didn't see the rules as rules heavy or rules light. I didn't see them as chunky. I didn't see them as problematic. I seen them as more in depth, more ex in inclusive and with an even wider pool of stuff to work from. Now, I wasn't believing that I was some neophyte uh, uh, guy who's going to become uh, a, a religious, i.e. gaming fanatic who absolutely adheres to the standard TSR format because, once again, I, I initially began with D&D, with TSR stuff, uh, and some of Gygax's stuff. The World of Greyhawk was my first world, pre-made world that I, I played and, and GM'd in. But I made so many more of my own because that's what the rules encouraged. Plus, we didn't have the finances and we didn't have a wide range of material. It wasn't until the late 80s, the mid 80s, that the Forgotten Realms and Dragonlance and so on and so on. Uh, I tapped into Judges Guild, but it was later. It was after I got my driver's license and was able to go to Ivor's Dungeon to the game store on a regular basis and had time to just mill about to nose through the boxes of material that he had stashed on the lower shelves. Not just the, the, the mainline stuff that was the hot night, the hot item of the moment, but the, some of the older stuff that by then was considered older stuff. Now it's archaic. It's archaic stuff. And I was able to purchase and acquire these things and they expanded my knowledge and my understanding. My learning curve grew. It grew. And yet I still didn't have access to the internet. I didn't have social media. I didn't have YouTube. I didn't have a bunch of guys like me, like you, 
creating thousands and tens of thousands of videos with opinions and, and ideas and concepts and explanations and interpretations of these various sets of rules that we now enjoy and embrace. So we have to look at, I look at it as, a, as like I said, this, this growing, this ever growing learning curve. Now, a younger generation comes into, into the gaming industry. It's, a, it's 40, 50 years into its establishment. It is heavily established, well established. There are so many niche games now that if you cannot find a game system that appeals to you, then you're not really wanting to be a gamer. That's just the truth. There's such a wide range of material available. Rather, it's the mainline megalithic uh, corporate church of D&D &D, or one of these sidebar cult runabouts that are that are clinging to the sides and 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 the, the true underground stuff that's running around on the fringes that you can only get through uh, the internet now uh, it's there the niches are filled and they continue to be filled a new niche will appear and somebody fills it and that's an awesome thing so uh, did we I think we had a greater uh, we have a much greater learning curve in the earlier days than we do now because you don't an inverted curve. You don't need to ad lib as much now. If you don't understand a set of rules, there's a hundred different people out there by via YouTube alone who will give you their take on what those rules mean. Uh, you can pretty much Google most topics, most mainline topics in the gaming hobby and industry and get some sort of hit on them. And if not, there are plenty of, of channels such as the RPG Brigade and RPG Tabletop Gamers and on and on and on that you can sit down and, and lay out and have absolutely no problem uh, getting your answers that you seek. So, is it a wider learning curve today for the new generation? I, I don't think so. I think uh, on there are some grand advantages to where we come, where we are now and from where we came, compared to where we came from. And for those who weren't there, who didn't didn't ad lib and fire from the hip and play by the seat of their pants in the early days, it's hard to really understand what that's what that meant. It really is. We can talk about. I can talk about all I want, and and I encourage others to do so. Rob Gusterson and and Ivan Mike and a hundred others. By all the love of God, get as much information out as you can because. It's the, it, it needs to be there. It needs to be there for the somebody to come along and go, ah, or hmm, or hmm, or think, or get the, the juices going. Because, you know, maybe perhaps it's going to be that key piece that's missing from all the others. Somebody hasn't quite covered it quite the way that the individual is seeking for. Because we see that well, we're going to that, that analogy of religion again. Okay, well, we see that to the same thing with religion. In Christianity, there are a slew of splinters. You know, from Catholics to Lutherans to Methodists to so on and so on and so on. And then within the various branches, there are sub-branches and so on and so on and so on. And all of them boils down to interpretations of the same set of mechanical rules and the same set of, of stories and, and what have you that everybody else works from. There's not 50 different kinds of Bibles saying 50 different counter counterdictive things. The lion's share of them use the same one or two core books, if you will, in the religion, and, and a thousand interpretations of it, a million interpretations of it. There goes the learning curve. Is it? It's still a curve. There's still things to learn, you know. And and this is from forty odd years of experience. I still am learning. I acknowledge that in my videos. I see things like Ron Ed, uh, Ron Edwards's take on stuff, and I go, Ah, oh, this man has done a lot of research and talked to some people and filled in those missing blanks in my own history to some degree. I don't always necessarily agree with everything he said, but I look at it from a literal perspective uh, as the seminar, as the lecture, as the, the you know, an outsider's view on the industry, specifically on TSR. Maybe I would preferred that he didn't liken it to a religion because then it starts to muddle the waters a little bit. I think his original non-religious track 
was an awesome thing, and it's an awesome thing, and it's very instructive, and I would encourage everybody in the, in, uh, the, industry, the gaming hobby that are true enthusiasts or would-be academics to view those videos and take away from it what you do, what you will. So, there you go, the learning curve. Is it maybe, I, I don't know, it, it, it's improved. I will not argue that. It's much simpler now than it was then. But at the same time, I can have to wonder if maybe there's too many preconceived opinions and concepts on those said rules. I think at the end of the day, the individual and his rule or her rule book sits down and reads this material, takes away from it what they wish to take away or want to take away or can take away and apply it to their gameplay, whether they are players or game masters or both or neither. Uh, it's still a necessary element of understanding what it is we're trying to do here. And if you're having fun and you're entertaining yourself and your friends and you find yourself going home and smiling more than you go home cursing, then you've achieved what it is that the original creators, Gary Gygax and a, and a slew of others back in the day. And as much as I would say I revere Gary Gygax for his contribute, you know, his contributions, he himself is not the sole creator of the hobby. Now, that's one of the things that I think Ed, uh, uh, Ron Edwards missed a little bit or chose not to because he had a lot of material and he can't include everything. Uh, I think he did a credible job of it, but there are and were game systems that were parallel to D&D at the time and slightly before that. Now, some of those or majority of those might be considered a war, war gaming, tabletop war gaming material, and I won't argue that, but I honestly think that it was, I don't know if it was a coincidence or what, but it sure was interesting considering how long I know it takes to, at a couple years at minimum, to come up with a good set of rules and supporting material for any game system, for several game systems to just slam out there. As soon as Gygax stuff hit the shelves, we start seeing this escalating, this escalating pyramid of material grow and more and more and more stuff poured out there. So obviously others were along, thinking along those lines and had dabbled with some material or were process, in the process of making stuff for the personal consumption and then saw Gygax's stuff on the shelf and said, aha, well, he can do that, I can do that. And we're still doing it. We're still doing it. You know, I, I don't know uh, Eric Bloat's story, but I suspect he's in that category. Still creating still reaching for the pinnacle of the pyramid. There's your learning curve from the Fat Man GM. My take on it anyway.